Good morning. Good morning. I realize the parking was challenging today. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll, we were delaying just a couple of minutes to make sure everybody got in. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Cindy Miller, President of the World Fairs Council on behalf of Dr. Park and the Chair of Great Decisions and the rest of the council. Welcome. This is, I believe, the fifth session that we have. Um, and I'd like to remind you all to silence your cell phones, which I forgot to do, so hopefully it doesn't go off while I'm up here. Now, for those new to Great Decisions, uh, it's the largest grassroots infants on international affairs, so there's lots of these going on across the, uh, across the United States. And uh, so they always, there's always that ballot you can fill out uh, for the Foreign Policy Association and let them know what you think about these issues to help try to influence uh, the uh, policies. Uh, the Council would like to thank the Norfolk Commission on the Arts and Humanities for a generous grant in support of this event. Uh, Dr. Dave Resselman, who I think is out there making sure everybody gets in, and Norfolk Academy for hosting this event, and also our corporate sponsors listed in your program, which includes Penrod, Bay Diesel, and SunTrust. With their support, they've demonstrated a, a big commitment to the community education and the global standing Hampton Roads. Uh, we have some great upcoming events. Now, next week we'll have Dr. Simon Cervati speaking on Pax Americana. And then also, how many of you do the Norfolk Forum at all? Any of So uh, the Norfolk Forum uh, contacted us and gave us a special deal. And so uh, if you're members of the World Affairs Council, so Tuesday, February 20th at Chrysler Hall, uh, they have John Brennan, who's the former director of the CIA, uh, for an insider's look at American national security and its future prosperity amidst the rise of partisanship and polarization in our political discourse. So their tickets are $51, but um, I'll put instructions on the website. I think either you co contact them or you send them a check, but you can get them um, for $40 instead of $51. So I'll post that this weekend on the website in case you're interested on attending that February 20th. And then uh, Thursday, March 8th at the Sloper, we have Dr. Trude Parsi uh, to talk about Iran and uh, our policy towards there and where it might go with the Trump administration. And Thursday, March 22nd at Old Dominion University, we'll have Ambassador Daniel Freed and talk about the state of world affairs. And uh, he's recently retired as America's longest living diplomat, serving through four decades and for seven presidents. Um, that one will be a free event, so there won't be any registration for that one. It's at Old Dominion University, same place we had David Ignatius in the Mills Godwin Center. So it'll just be just show up if you want to go to that event. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Park. Thank you, Cindy. It is my distinct pleasure today to introduce to you someone that many of you are familiar with, and that is Ambassador Bismarck Myrick. He is a retired United States ambassador with postings to Lesotho and Liberia. Um, he is an absolutely <coughs> remarkable man. Not only has he served in the American Foreign Service, but he has also been in the Vietnam War. And during, for the time that he spent um, in his career with the United States Army, he earned a Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, and a Purple Heart for Valor in Combat. Um, he is a lecturer now at Old Dominion University, a position he took upon retirement from the Foreign Service, and there he teaches courses in the Department of History and the Department of Political Science. But there's another aspect to him, Ambassador Myrick is a consummate citizen of his hometown Portsmouth, and to honor him they have named two streets after him, but he has tremendous civic involvement um, in his own hometown. And he's also served on the board of the World Affairs Council here, which is where many of you have, I think, come to know and appreciate his generosity. He has been honored by the countries in, in which he served many times over. He has been honored, um, I think, at Old Dominion University as much as by the World Affairs Council here. We very much appreciate his consummate public service, which he continues to this day, and today he's doing what he is um, most dedicated to, is sharing his experience um, and his knowledge about the continent he loves and the country that he is so immensely familiar with. Please welcome Ambassador Bismarck Myrick. Good morning. 
I want to thank uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Regina Koch, for that uh, kind and generous uh, introduction. I want to thank as well uh, Dr. Cindy Miller and uh, the uh, World Affairs Council of uh, Greater Hampton Road for inviting me to stop over this morning to uh, share some thoughts uh, on uh, one of my favorite uh, topics that I'm calling South Africa Accomplishments uh, and uh, Challenges for a Unique State uh, in uh, Transition. Indeed, a unique state as you may recall, uh, South Africa completed uh, one of uh, the world's most profound uh, political transformations, accomplished uh, uh, the world's uh, first uh, heart transplant, abandoned a nuclear weapons uh, program, produced uh, Africa's uh, first uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Chief Albert Latuli, uh, and a, a number of uh, other Nobel Prize awardees, including Nelson Mandela and uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The country also has uh, beautiful uh, cities and parks and, and tourist uh, attractions, and uh, uniquely, again, it uh, uh, hosted uh, Africa's first uh, FIFA World Cup in 2010. The challenges include uh, the impact that uh, these uh, changes have had on the various populations uh, uh, in the country. So to help us uh, deal with uh, an introduction to the, these uh, issues, uh, I have uh, proposed a few factors for our consideration, including um, a survey of the historical uh, backdrop, look at uh, some of the economic uh, factors, the changing uh, international uh, relations uh, situation, the complex internal political uh, dynamics, offer uh, some, some thoughts on uh, the future. And my favorite part uh, of our time together this morning is to address any of your questions and uh, Comments. South Africa is uh, located uh, at the, the southern tip of the African continent. It's bordered uh, by the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, Indian uh, Ocean. Internally, it has uh, nine administrative regions or provinces. And uh, just in terms of historical overview, the Africans were busy uh, carrying out their traditional uh, practices, interacting uh, uh, amongst uh, their uh, ethnic groups of uh, doing uh, uh, empire building. Uh, when uh, the Europeans uh, arrived in the mid uh, 17th uh, uh, century, these settlers arrived uh, in uh, Cape Town. And over the next uh, two uh, centuries, interacted with the Africans and themselves. Uh, many conflicts uh, took place over that uh, two century uh, period. <coughs> the uh, Europeans, uh, mostly those of, of Dutch ancestry, uh, began to uh, move uh, north out of the Cape uh, uh, area uh, in a movement that the historians uh, have called uh, uh, the Great Trek. 
In around the same time, the, this was the uh, beginning of, of the uh, 19th uh, uh, century, the Africans were involved in a major uh, population shift. The historians call that uh, the uh, Infocani. And uh, attribute uh, this uh, movement uh, uh, to the activities uh, sparked uh, by uh, Shocker, who became the, uh, the emperor uh, of uh, the uh, Zulu nation. Well, over time, the Europeans, both the uh, British uh, and the Dutch, began to assert uh, political and uh, economic uh, dominance uh, over uh, the uh, area in an attempt to uh, deny South African uh, citizenship to the uh, other groups, isolating them to entities uh, called uh, uh, homelands uh, associated with uh, their ethnic identification taking control over the economic uh, resources and uh, claiming control uh, over the political process. This uh, procedure culminated uh, in the formulation in uh, 1848 of a system of rule called uh, apartheid. And in summary, the apartheid system separated people by race group. And uh, these uh, race groups uh, included uh, uh, the whites or Europeans, a uh, uh, mixed race group uh, that uh, uh, has been called colored, the uh, Indians, uh, and uh, the uh, Africans. All of this uh, was intended to give uh, the white South Africans uh, uh, absolute uh, control uh, both uh, over the state and over the economy and the sources for the uh, economy. And it involved as well the white South Africans forming a nation of South Africa that uh, represented uh, uh, the white uh, group and uh, labeling the other members of the population as being members of uh, nations associated with their ethnic uh, group. So of course uh, there was a reaction to all of this, a growing protest emerged uh, uh, internally amongst uh, uh, African personalities uh, and groups. There were some uh, iconic figures who serviced uh, out of this protest uh, uh, movement of uh, people such as uh, Steve uh, Biko, uh, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu, as well as a series of uh, protests by students, many of them arrested, uh, beat up, otherwise abused, and some killed. And in the mix, uh, Nelson Mandela, who was a leader of the protest against uh, apartheid, was uh, arrested and he became the most prominent symbol for a protest against uh, apartheid. Uh, for his uh, anti-apartheid uh, actions, he was arrested and uh, spent uh, 27 years uh, uh, in jail. He was uh, released uh, through a negotiations uh, process that uh, included uh, representatives of uh, uh, the government 
the government was headed by a party called uh, the National Party. Uh, its uh, state uh, president was uh, F.W. the clerk. And through the negotiations of, of process, uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, finally uh, released uh, from jail uh, in February of 1990. Now, I had the good fortune of uh, arriving in South Africa to head the United States uh, diplomatic mission uh, in uh, Durban, uh, South Africa, a few weeks uh, after Nelson Mandela was released uh, from prison given me an opportunity to observe and to participate uh, in close-up the machinations uh, that uh, led to the formation of a first negotiating a process for a new <coughs> political arrangement uh, uh, and uh, preparations for uh, elections. The elections uh, took place uh, in April of 1994, and uh, Nelson Mandela was elected president, the first African president uh, of South Africa. And this came about uh, because the political parties in South Africa have their party uh, leaders uh, compete in the national election for the presidency. Nelson Mandela uh, was a member of the African National Congress. The African National Congress, or the ANC, was uh, formed uh, uh, in uh, 1912. It was the party also uh, of Chief uh, Albert Latouli, whom I mentioned a moment ago, Africa's first uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner. So while he was uh, in jail, Nelson uh, Mandela uh, continued to be popular amongst uh, the ANC, ANC uh, supporters, uh, and uh, uh, the broader national and uh, uh, world uh, communities. When he was released, uh, the ANC and the other political parties that had been banned uh, by the apartheid uh, uh, system uh, competed in the elections uh, process, and the ANC uh, is uh, the largest uh, uh, political party in South Africa. Well, Nelson Mandela was uh, the deputy president of the ANC. The president was uh, Oliver Tambo, a very active uh, political figure and anti-apartheid uh, champion. But uh, within months after Nelson Mandela was uh, released from prison, Oliver Tambo uh, had a stroke and was unable to carry out uh, presidential uh, duties. So the party voted uh, to elevate Nelson Mandela to be president. And that is how Nelson Mandela became uh, a competitor for the national uh, election for the presidency of, uh, of the country. Nelson Mandela did a very unusual thing. Actually, he did a lot of very unusual things. And for that reason, as we know, uh, he is recognized as perhaps uh, the, the most respected political figure uh, of uh, the last uh, uh, century. But what he did at this time was to announce that uh, he would serve uh, on the one five-year term as president. <coughs> and 
fine. That's what you did. I just turned, ended, he stepped down. And he was followed uh, in uh, office uh, by his, uh, at that time, deputy, uh, Talbo Mbeki. Talbo Mbeki had been a protege of Nelson Mandela, known as uh, an intellectual, one who believed in uh, strategic uh, planning, also very uh, uh, active in international affairs and promoting South Africa's leadership uh, in South Africa in uh, uh, regional developments such as the, the uh, South African Community SADAC, the Southern African Development of, of Community, and continent-wide. He participated uh, with the heads of state of five other uh, African countries, those being Algeria, Egypt, Senegal, uh, and, and Nigeria uh, in forming uh, uh, the new plan for, for African uh, development, which was aimed at uh, allowing the Africans to take the initiatives for a positive social and economic change on the African uh, continent. Uh, this organization has been incorporated into the current regional organization called the, the African uh, Union. Talba and Becky uh, served for uh, two terms, but at the end of his uh, second term, he came under a cloud of, of protest, mostly led by his deputy, who was uh, Jacob Zuma. Jacob uh, Zuma uh, was um, very active in characterizing Tobu and Becky as being detached uh, from uh, the needs of ordinary uh, South Africans uh, and was uh, able to, to force Talbot and Becky out of his position as president of the African uh, National Congress before he completed uh, his uh, second term uh, as president. Then Zuma was elevated, elected by the ANC to become its new president. And thereby, when the election took place at the national level in 2009, Jacob Zuma became president of South Africa. He also had been a protege of Nelson Mandela. But he immediately came uh, under a, a cloud uh, because of his uh, personal uh, behavior, uh, things such as uh, he's a polygamist, but that's okay uh, in, the, in the culture. He was married to uh, six women one of them passed away, and one other uh, divorced him, and I'll talk about that one in, in a moment, leaving him before, but he was also known to be involved in extramarital affairs and even father children uh, outside of, uh, of these uh, marriages. Perhaps more impactful is the fact that uh, he was alleged to have been involved in national level 
level corruption. Things such as using state resources to build a personal luxury residence. He also, back on personal behavior, was uh, accused of rape and went to trial uh, for this accusation <coughs> and was not uh, uh, convicted on some procedural uh, grounds. So, <coughs> he is currently the president of South Africa. And I will come back to these internal political dynamics in just a moment. But what about the economic factors? Well, South Africa is uh, Africa's uh, second largest uh, economy, second to Nigeria, although within the last couple of years, these two countries have uh, uh, switched uh, back and forth and which of uh, the African countries among them uh, has the largest uh, uh, economy. But we do know that uh, South Africa has uh, uh, among the world's uh, uh, leading holdings of, uh, of diamonds and, and gold and uh, and other uh, natural resources. But the economy is uh, strained uh, by still uh, high unemployment. Some estimates are that uh, as many as uh, 25 to 40 percent of the people are unemployed. And most of these are, are young people. We know that uh, there is uh, substandard uh, housing in some areas uh, and growing complaints against uh, the government uh, uh, headed by uh, Jacob uh, Zuma. And it's clear that uh, inequities uh, amongst uh, the, the groupings in the country uh, continue to uh, to exist. But let me just share with you the fact that uh, there are uh, signs of, uh, of positive uh, change. I'd like to point uh, uh, to someone I know. Uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Bonga Sibisi. Bonga Sibisi was uh, my chauffeur when I was Consul General in, in Durban. At the end of my uh, tenure there, uh, he left the employment of the, of the United States, moved to uh, his uh, community, and uh, opened a telephone uh, card and equipment uh, distribution business. Operating <coughs> first up out of this uh, container style building. And over a period of about uh, three years, uh, he was able to raise enough uh, resources that allowed him to, to get a mortgage uh, uh, on, uh, on this home uh, in his community called uh, Newlands East. And that represents uh, uh, the fact uh, that there are opportunities of changing uh, <coughs> for uh, a, a growing uh, middle class uh, in South Africa. Let me also just, uh, as an aside, uh, uh, mention something that is a new phenomenon that we haven't uh, uh, done much uh, research on, and that is that there is a a growing middle class throughout most of, of Africa, and 
members of this middle class are behaving in ways that previous middle classes have not behaved. For one thing, they are focused uh, primarily on building uh, wealth and, and expanding their own economic uh, lifestyles. And the departure in this regard is that they seem not to be too motivated towards political engagement, uh, unlike uh, previous uh, middle classes. So you see them uh, traveling around the world now. They are climbing mountains such as uh, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. They are sending their uh, children based on their own resources, not government resources, to some of the best schools uh, uh, in the world. And overall, uh, building a better quality life of life uh, for, them, for themselves. But again, the downside of this is that they they seem to be more detached from from the masses of their uh, populations. What about uh, international uh, trends? Well, South Africa joined. Uh, uh, a group of nations, the uh, BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, and uh, China uh, in uh, 2010. And especially under the leadership of, uh, of Tabo and Becky, became more involved uh, in dispatching peacekeeping Troops to deal with uh, uh, Africa's violent uh, conflicts. This continued until the deployment uh, of South African troops uh, to the Central African Republic, where a number of them were killed. And after that, the South African uh, public wondered why uh, South Africa was taking on this burden and put pressure on the government to uh, withdraw uh, South Africa from so many of these peacekeeping uh, operations. South Africa is a leader of the regional organization that I mentioned a moment ago, the uh, Southern Africa Development uh, Community. And similar to many African countries, China is the country's main and leading trading partner. And what about relations with the United States? Well, South Africa and the U.S. Uh, have partnerships uh, in the areas of uh, health, of security, uh, and trade. Regarding uh, health, you know, the United States uh, government uh, took the lead in providing the resources to address the uh, HIV AIDS uh, pandemic, especially uh, under the government of uh, President uh, uh, George W. Bush, who launched uh, <coughs> the president's uh, initiative on uh, a program uh, for addressing uh, AIDS uh, relief, providing uh, from the United States government uh, uh, 15 billion dollars over a five-year period. No other country in the world had provided this kind of assistance, and. This program, the PEPFAR program, was uh, repeated for a second five-year period uh, under uh, George W. Bush's presidency. President Bush is very popular uh, in, in Africa because of this 
type of, uh, of intervention. The Obama administration continued the PEPFAR program for his first term. But in the second term, the Obama administration began to, to put pressure on the African countries themselves to provide more of their own national resources to, uh, to address this type of health issue. And it expanded it to uh, include uh, other ailments uh, such as uh, uh, tuberculosis and uh, uh, malaria. The United States and South Africa, uh, however, overall share development objectives. We know that uh, South Africa is a leading uh, economic player, both regionally uh, and uh, on the continent, and has formed a unique bilateral relationship with the U.S aimed at uh, cooperation on international issues. There's the formation of a formal process called a uh, strategic dialogue that's aimed at, uh, at deepening this uh, cooperation. Now let's return to the uh, internal uh, political uh, dynamics that's in the news uh, now. Very complex. And it centers on the fact that there is a widespread belief that uh, Zuma has uh, neglected domestic uh, development and international affairs and uh, used uh, his uh, office to enrich himself, his family, and uh, African National Congress associates. Critics have pointed to what is being called uh, throughout uh, South Africa, state capture. This involves uh, corrupt business relationships, mainly with uh, an Indian a family called uh, the Gupta family. And these uh, Gupta family members, uh, allegedly, uh, have uh, paid uh, for positions of uh, senior government uh, Officials have influenced the appointment of ministers and others in the high places in, in government and uh, have overall uh, cultivated a governmental process of, uh, of corruption. And there is a widespread belief amongst the South Africans that this is going on. Uh, and because of that, are uh, very critical of uh, the Zuma administration. And relatedly, opposition parties, mainly the Democratic Alliance and the Economic Freedom Fighters, have uh, led parliamentary protests against uh, Zuma and uh, have eight times raised uh, in the parliament uh, our votes uh, of no confidence. But each time Jacob Zuma has survived, the Democratic Alliance is worthy of our attention. It evolved um, out of the disillusion and lack of effectiveness of members of the apartheid uh, national party. 
and also members of, of the uh, liberal white party called uh, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Alliance has uh, become more inclusive, however, and in fact, uh, its uh, president is a black South African. This party is gaining popularity, especially in the urban areas. And in the most recent uh, uh, local uh, elections, one in the major commercial center of the country, that being Johannesburg, won the Cape province, and even one in Nelson Mandela's province in the Eastern Cape. The economic freedom fighters what was the creation of a political opponent of the ANC called Julius Malema. Julius Malema had been a leader of, of the uh, Youth League of the African National uh, Congress. Became uh, disenchanted uh, with the ANC because uh, he wanted to see more aggressive actions towards uh, redistribution of the nation's wealth. He called for actually a nationalization of resources, redistribution of, of land, and has been the most uh, vociferous opponent of, of the of the government. And in this uh, context, Jacob Zuma's deputy, a man by the name of Cyril Ramaphosa, was elected president of the ANC at the ANC conference that took place uh, in December. This means that Sarah Ramaphosa, who also, by the way, was a protege of, of Nelson Mandela, is in the position of being elected the next uh, president of South Africa. And because the election does not take place until next year, 2019. Uh, in April, uh, there are calls for Jacob Zuma to step down now and uh, allow Sarah Ramaphosa to take uh, uh, both uh, leadership uh, uh, of the party uh, and uh, national uh, leadership. There have uh, been, over the last uh, few days, meetings between Jacob Zuma and uh, Sir Ramaphosa. There have been uh, others who have put pressure on uh, uh, Jacob Zuma to step down. Many things have happened that point to the possibility of his stepping down. Uh, for example, February, as I mentioned, is the month that Nelson Mandela was released uh, from prison. So it's a special uh, month. And there are a series of activities that uh, political leaders usually involve themselves in during this time. 
But because he is under such a cloud, Jacob Zuma has shied away from appearing uh, at these events. Moreover, traditionally, there is the responsibility for the president to deliver a state of the nation address. That was supposed to take place uh, a few days uh, from now. <coughs> that presentation has been canceled, giving further indications that uh, Jacob Zuma is uh, likely under pressure to step down. But Jacob Zuma said he's not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, and has been pretty vocal in his uh, opposition to being forced uh, uh, out of, of office. So that means there's a lot of political intrigue taking place uh, in the country. <laughs> but what about the future? Let me just share a couple of my views on this. The future will depend on several key personalities. And just quickly, uh, these uh, uh, include uh, this uh, woman here, uh, in Kosizana Lamini Zuma. She was in the government of Nelson Mandela. She's a medical doctor. She served uh, as Minister of uh, Health. She was Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Home Affairs. She had a good reputation, generally, amongst uh, the electorate. And she served as a chairman of the African Union Commission. The African Union Commission uh, is the decision-making uh, element of the continental organization, the African Union. She served one term, stepped down to come back to compete for the presidency uh, in South Africa. So she was the major competitor to Cyril uh, Ramaphosa. Many people thought she would win because of her solid reputation. But others questioned whether she would be effective because she is a former wife of Jacob Zuma. <laughs> and by African tradition, they say, if she is in a high position, her husband will make decisions. Especially, they say, since they have children together. So that uh, dampened uh, her possibility of being elected. But she came in second to Sarah Ramaphosa. Sarah Ramaphosa, as I said, a protege of, of Nelson Mandela, came up politically in the, the labor uh, movement. Highly respected. Many thought uh, that he should have followed uh, Nelson Mandela as president. But he left uh, politics, went into business became a multi-millionaire, stayed away for a while in his political activism and he was involved in the labor movements. Well, he uh, came back a couple of years ago uh, and uh, resumed uh, his high-profile activities within the, uh, the ANC. So, his success 
will determine uh, the political and economic future of, of South Africa. Another personality, one that I just mentioned, uh, Julius Malema, our head of the uh, economic freedom fighters. The most visible opponent of Jacob Zuma and he has already vowed that he will be an opponent of Cyril Ramaphosa, accusing Cyril Ramaphosa of being insensitive to the needs uh, of uh, a working class uh, South Africans. Moreover, you know, a few years ago there was a clash between uh, labor movement people in the government and a number of the protesters were killed and uh, this killing is linked to decision making made by uh, Cyril uh, Ramaphosa. This is a destabilizing uh, factor and will determine uh, the future. Another uh, personality of note is the man standing next to me here in the center. That is King uh, Goodwill Zvelatini. King Goodwill Zvelatini is the king of the Zulus. And the Zulus uh, form uh, the largest single ethnic group in South Africa. And Jacob Zuma is a Zulu, and the only Zulu who emerged to senior positions within uh, the ANC. So if King Goodwill's Velatini believes that Jacob Zuma is mistreated, then his followers will adopt similar uh, attitudes. And the Zulus, when they are politically connected, have been known to be violent. In fact, uh, uh, when Nelson Mandela was released in 1990, for the next uh, three years, there was deadly violence between uh, Zulu-supported political groups, mainly the Encarta Freedom Party, uh, and uh, the members of the uh, ANC. So King Goodwill Bulletin will determine uh, the, the future. Another factor, perhaps the major factor, centers on the economic conditions of most South Africans. As I said, large unemployment. Moreover, there is resentment directed against non-South Africans who come to the country uh, to live and work. Strong xenophobia of factor. Foreigners have been killed, especially uh, those uh, who come from uh, Zimbabwe, primarily because you, you find the Zimbabweans uh, uh, mainly in the service sectors, uh, in the uh, department uh, stores, in, in restaurants, and delivering other kinds of, of service. causing increasing uh, resentment on the part of, of South Africans. And this resentment, uh, if it uh, becomes more explosive, will determine the South Africans uh, future. So with that, uh, let me 
uh, ask that you consider these factors. And let me ask uh, uh, what questions you have after we take a break.